Hi, everybody. Um, right, so uh, I think we'll, we'll start. Um, so uh, good afternoon. It's been a great day so far. And uh, thank you very much for taking your time out to come and join us uh, for our little presentation. Um, as the title implies, uh, we've been delivering Cloud Foundry now for just about five years um, to deliver some uh, what we believe to be world class, but certainly business critical um, applications. Uh, we'll explain a little bit more as we go through. Um, but we thought we'd use this opportunity to share some of what we've learned along the way. Um, so I hope you enjoy it, or we hope you enjoy it. Um, do you want to introduce yeah, yourself? So my name's, oh, my name's Tim Savage. Um, I am the CEO and founder, one of the founders anyway, of uh, Arma Cooney. Um, I've got a background in sort of various areas of technology spanning over the last 20 years, embarrassingly. Um, and it culminated in forming Armour Cooney, which is a consultancy we put, uh, formed in 2012. So, yeah. Um, thanks. So I'm a, I'm a recent addition to the team. I've, um, <laughs> extremely excited to be here and extremely excited to be uh, a part of the Armour Cooney world. Um, I come from a, a world of tradition and problems and legacy IT. So when I met him a little while back, um, and he introduced me to Cloud Foundry and actually showed me an Agile pipeline. I was like, wow, bowled over, absolutely bought him from that day forward. And then conversations evolved and I finally fi I find myself talking to you guys now. Um, I've been immersed in this, I suppose, for the past uh, four or five months, but, but not much more. So I'm here really to introduce you, I guess, to my thoughts turning around, uh, trying, trying to employ what is amazing technology in, uh, in a world where people may not be quite as excited and may see it more as a threat and an issue. So more of a business perspective. Um, I used to be a technologist, uh, so I do have a background in technology, um, but that was uh, some time ago. And um, hmm. yeah, now uh, I focus around uh, helping larger organisations improve the way they work. So a little bit about what or who Arma Cooney is. Um, Software development, the way it should be done. That's uh, a very nice quote from one of our customers um, and something that uh, yeah, we, we, we think is uh, what we try to achieve. So we specialise in cloud native software development and our mission now really is to support organisations uh, doing things better, right? So uh, on the journey to uh, this amazing place that is cloud native and, uh, and supported by Cloud Foundry. So removing all the bottlenecks. Um, how do we do it? We, we either do it for them, our customers, or we help them do it for themselves. So it's either we give them the fish or we teach them how to fish. Um, and we, we've worked with uh, a number of organisations, and this presentation is our learnings from a number of organisations that we've worked with, both big and small, green field and some not so green. I think as a, we have to appreciate that about 80% of the world is steeped in legacy. Uh, one part of the um, at one part or another. Um, so we've got uh, some, some experience there with, with migrating and more brownfield projects. Um, but we are, we'd like to think of ourselves, and I think we are one of the UK's leading independent Cloud Foundry experts. Not only have we been using Cloud Foundry for five years, which is more than most people even know it existed, uh, I think. Um, but also uh, we use the open source version and we've worked with Pivotal and we've worked with IBM. So we've got quite a broad range of experience. Um, this is ultimately, I think, what we try to give our customers, right? And this is what it's all about. It's freedom to innovate. It's about putting the business value at the centre and to take out all the bottlenecks and remove all of the issues that people see about getting production-ready code into a production without all the pain that people seem to expect of today's uh, technology world. So it's about putting the customer and business value at the center of everything. Um, so we are here to give back and just talk through some of what we've learned along the way. Um, but first, I think it's important to give you a little bit of context. We'll, we'll, Tim will take you through uh, a case study um, briefly, spend five, 10 minutes just taking you through a case study of how we've delivered uh, one business critical app you can, uh, for, uh, for comic relief, and then we'll go on to some of the learnings that have come as a result of that. 
Thanks, Ben. Uh, so this is something we've talked about before. You know, some people might be familiar with some aspects of it, but a lot of people probably won't be. Um, one of our clients is Comet Relief, uh, a UK charity. Uh, they were set up in 1985, and they have a mission statement, which is a just world free from poverty. Um, they're famous for the Red Nose Day campaign, which I'm, I imagine a lot of people will be familiar with. It's a big campaign which culminates in a telethon. Um, they've raised in excess of a billion pounds sterling uh, over their lifetime, uh, and each individual campaign these days will raise sort of somewhere in the region of 100 odd million pounds. So it's big numbers. Um, the telethons, when they happen, they take over the BBC, so uh, BBC One will be nothing but the telethon from 7 till 2 in the morning. Uh, they occasionally have a break for the news, it happens some years, not in other years, but um, very much the UK public is immersed in these events and you it's pretty hard to avoid them generally, uh, unless people make a concerted effort. Um, so yeah, the audiences will be in the region of 20 million, varies over the evening, but we are, you know, sort of prime time TV at that point in time. Um, and Alma Cooney have built and run the platform that takes all of the car payments for uh, these events. So we cover web, mobile, and uh, anything through the call centers. Um, so to give you some rough numbers, um, it's seven hours long. We take, uh, or we have to cope with in the region of 400 payments per second. That's the metric which we build for to be able to handle. Those are live uh, customer payments. Um, to give you some context on the, the 400, the UK as a whole um, averages at 360 transactions a second for car payments for absolutely everything. So that's to give you a sort of scale of what 400 is in terms of you know, uh, national levels. Um, we expect somewhere in the region of 100,000 concurrent public web users. Uh, we also have 14,000 call centre operators that will be logged in and using an application and working sort of constantly taking donations as the calls come in. Uh, and we expect somewhere in the region of uh, 800,000 uh, transactions during the evening. So that's our sort of scale. So to summarise the challenge, um, we have no second chance. We run for one night. Um, once a year, seven hours, uh, we take tens of millions of pounds and we can't fail. You know, there is no option. People don't come back the next day and sort of want to donate. They're emotional at the time. They're not buying a TV and they'll get it from the next store or whatever, you know, just, it doesn't happen. So we have that one chance. Uh, okay, so they've been running it for, the, you know, the organization has been running for 25 years and before us, they had a you know, platform. Um, they've been doing it for, you know, as I say, 25 years. Um, before we came along, it was a Java monolith that was, you know, the platform that was running this whole thing. It had evolved over nine years, I think, and was largely a, you know, a black box in terms of what it did. Um, testing was entirely manual at, you know, all levels. Um, so it's very limited. There were, you know, masses of potential for human error, big gaps. Uh, deployment was manual. Um, I remember sort of regular shouts along the lines of, ah, you know, the, the new... JavaScript files are on half the servers and not the rest, you know, all sorts of things and issues that we had to solve at the time. Um, they had uh, single points of failure, so infrastructure providers, uh, platforms, bandwidth, payment providers, all of these things were single points of failure that at any point in time could and did go wrong. Um, and also, also to pull the event together, there was a very complex matrix of providers. So lots of organizations got involved. We had somewhere in the region of between 40 and 50 people coming together to make this event happen. But they're all partners and big organizations sort of pulling their resources together. And then after a while, that started to fall apart as these sort of, well, not fall apart, but the partners were starting to compete and they all wanted different sort of involvement levels. Originally, they all had their own little areas and then they started crossing over and going up and down the stack in terms of what they would, uh, or what they delivered as an organization. Um, and also, you know, in terms of the testing, it was largely a one-year feedback cycle. So we take the learnings from one event, work on them during the year, and then you know, apply them the next year. And you know, that was literally the cycle. So this is our solution. Um, we took a Java monolith uh, and turned it into a sort of microservices architecture. I'm using this slide that was used by Gartner uh, in the Catalyst conference uh, two weeks ago, I think it was. Um, and this was used to illustrate best practice multi-cloud. Um, 
we took the sort of black box, monolith, black box monolith and turned it into a sort of microservices architecture. Uh, there are within this, uh, you know, what you can see here is sort of the multi-cloud deployment, but there are 28 microservices in there that are running the whole thing. Um, it's distributed across multiple infrastructure service providers and multiple continents. So it's quite, you know, it's, it's truly multi-cloud. Um, we took the enterprise relational database and turned it into distributed data stores using eventual consistency uh, and event sourced architecture. We took the lack of confidence uh, and turned, you know, used test driven development, BDD, uh, and a full suite of automated tests to get to a point where um, you know, we could then put in place full continuous deployment. Uh, everything now is as code. Um, all automated, and as you can see, every change gets pushed and will go all the way through into production. Um, so what was once a one-year feedback cycle is now you know, 50 times a day when we're working on it actively. Uh, so now developers can make changes with confidence. Um, we took high-spec hardware, moved to infrastructure as a service um, underneath the PaaS layer. Um, we took limited scalability and turned it into sort of unlimited horizontal scalability. And we took the partner list that from, uh, down to one team. So it's now four people that built, well, it's five built it, four run it. Um, and that's how it's run for the last few years. Everything's as code, uh, apps, infrastructure, pipeline. And I guess, yeah, the sort of end result of all that, everything is code, so that's where the knowledge is. All of it's contained within the code. There's no sideline knowledge, you know, sort of key man dependency or anything along those lines. So the result for the business, um, so far, it's been a total success. 90% reduction in team size. Um, we've run four events over the last five years and processed millions of transactions. Um, although surprisingly, it's only actually been, you know, doing its job for 28 hours over that period of time, which is Quite weird when you put it in those terms. Um, but yeah, it's an equivalent of five million pounds worth of savings in terms of the cost that the organisation has to bear. Um, and we're now in a situation where we can push the entire thing and you know, we push changes to production in 15 minutes. So we've been able to push changes during an event whilst taking you know, up to 100 transactions a second. We can push changes into production. So, what have we learned? <laughs> Good question. Okay, so that gives you some sort of um, uh, idea. It's to put it into context, to give you a little bit of background in terms of one of the projects that we've worked on. That was more greenfield, moving from a, from a, a Java monolith over to, uh, if you like, having carte blanche over the architecture. And the key decisions that we made to run with Cloud Foundry five years ago um, <coughs> has, often, has proven to be a, a, the right decision. Um, I think there are, there are a lot of options at the time, but we decided that uh, that, that was right for us, and um, and we've stood to uh, we, we we've uh, stood to to turn uh, to tell the tale. So what have we learned? So there's lots of things that we have learned. Um, learned that I need my glasses wherever they may be because I can't. I'm getting old and I can't actually read anymore. Um, so we uh, so I suppose the most important thing that we we've learned is that. Um, everyone can benefit from Cloud Foundry. There is not um, an application or, a, or an instance where we believe that, uh, that Cloud Foundry cannot be deployed. There is one we've, we've, we've spoken with and we continue to talk with a client that, that is actually running high frequency applications, high frequency trading, and we're looking at ways that we can utilize Cloud Foundry to benefit them in a way that uh, will still service a lot of their needs and introduce um, some sort of improvements in the way they work. Um, but what's, uh, what's important is that whether you're big or small, whether you're startup, whether you're traditional, whether you've got legacy, whether you've got Greenfield site, there is always a way that you can employ Cloud Foundry. Um, but Cloud Foundry and uh, Cloud Native is a big shift for some. Um, culture, um, industry does not necessarily allow the widespread adoption. So a lot of people in the next, uh, over the next couple of days, you would have heard some already and you'll hear some more, no doubt, um, will be evangelizing Cloud Foundry. 
And so they should, right? It's an amazing piece of technology. It's absolutely fundamental in terms of and has the ability to change the world. Um, and we all believe in that, right? We're all sat in this room and we're all around this conference because we believe that Cloud Foundry has the ability to fundamentally change the way IT is delivered. Uh, I'm prone to getting on my soapbox. Um, but the problem that we have um, as a community and as a platform is the success that Cloud Foundry has. And one of the key learnings that we have is its ability to be consumed within an organization without giving the organization indigestion. So the adoption has to be specific to your organization. There are different people that play a very significant part in Cloud Foundry's adoption and the move to cloud native. Um, now, we had a very interesting uh, conversation at the unconference last night where we were talking about different points of resistance. And it's really interesting to hear different views, whether it's the developers, whether, which seem to be very much split halfway down the middle. Um, some see it as this exciting opportunity to improve the way they work and, and genuinely take more control. Others are more prone to inertia and actually see it more as a threat because they're having to relearn a lot of the stuff that they've taken for granted. They're in a position of power and they don't really see it as a, as, as a benefit. They see it more of a threat. Um, you've got the DevOps and the infrastructure teams that some people think that they are used to picking up new systems as you go. So therefore, it's just a new platform. It's a new product which they have to pick up and, and they're expected to deploy. Great, and they, they don't have a problem. Others feel that it's a massive threat and that they're about to, it's a bit like selling Christmas to turkeys. It doesn't work. Um, so adoption has to be specific to your organization and it has to be balanced. There is this purist view where Cloud Foundry comes as a bigger package, where it is Cloud Foundry, Cloud Native, 12 Fractor apps, microservice architecture, can't be used for legacy, can't be used for, every, everything has to be moved over to this way of working. And then there's the more pragmatic approach, which is an actual fact. So I had a very interesting conversation um, last night about how Cloud Foundry can be deployed and you can, you, you can build infrastructure services and almost not quite as easy as, as, as being completely transparent or completely hidden, depending on, from, from, from the developers and, and from parts of the organization that may actually push back on it. But you can actually deploy it in a way that um, more softly, softly. So you're actually building this wave without even people realizing it by employing Cloud Foundry. Um, and then when people, when you're presenting this new way of working, people are like, well, uh, I don't like that. It's never going to work. And you say, but you've been using it for six months and you didn't even really know it. So all these subtle changes that we've made to the way that you work. So the most important thing, or one of the most important things that we've learned and we continue to learn is that adoption of Cloud Foundry and its ultimate success is dependent on the individual drivers within the organization. To be able to appreciate that sometimes the cultural shift is too much. When you've got five, seven and a half thousand developers across multiple geographies and they've been stuck in the world of delivering waterfall and they've been reliant on massive test cycles to be able to take away this need for them to actually write good code then you're going to struggle to get actually employ Cloud Foundry in a way that you perhaps want to. And I think as, as you know, we're all here, right? Because we all want to see Cloud Foundry adopted um, and we all see it as beneficial to us. Um, so it's important that we look at the ways that we can influence management, uh, DevOps, other developers, our peers to be able to improve uh, its adoption in a way that best befits our organization. So this purest view, Sometimes you'll just be banging your head against a brick wall and it hurts. So sometimes it's more pragmatic approach. Um, so moving on from that, perhaps certainly one of the one of, if not the singularly most important benefit of Cloud Foundry in, in our five years experience is that it creates a single contract. So if you imagine, so we, we were talking about this the other day, and we've been using Cloud Foundry for five years. Um, and within that five years, we have used Cloud Foundry as a platform, as a service. 
Now, if we hadn't chosen Cloud Foundry and we'd chosen to use a different technology, whether it was building our own custom PaaS, as a lot of organisations have done, um, or we've chosen another route, we, we reckon that we would have done things three times over. Um, there's the technology churn. So we would have had to continually update our custom PaaS or the technologies that we were using as these technologies either became redundant or they evolved. Um, and still there are organisations that are pushing back on the adoption of something like Cloud Foundry as an industry standard, open source, um, de facto PaaS to use, um, because they have invested a lot of time and effort in their own custom PaaS. And they have these massive teams that have built it and that have blood, sweat and tears have gone into these things. But every time that there is a new technology, every time there is a change, they have to invest time and effort uh, to improve that. Um, Cloud Foundry does it, right? It, they've got a bunch of developers and a bunch of technologists that are doing it for you. So every time that you're, and, and it's transparent to you, you just roll out the next version. We heard, um, we heard Sam earlier saying about the, 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 all the new features that they're bringing out. Uh, it's got everybody firmly um, on side in, in developing its functionality. So, but it's the single contract. So for us as developers, it doesn't matter, right? We're just using Cloud Foundry. That's, that's incredible. The other thing is, of course, is uh, for, for, it removes the need to retrain your team. So if, you, if you're using um, Cloud Foundry, then it's a consistent contract. There is CF push, right? And everything that goes around um, Cloud Foundry, you're not having to train them on different, uh, so you train them on one platform and then you, you decide for whatever reason that you're going to upgrade or you're going to throw that out and get in something else. So you have to retrain, but also, from a, from a developer's point of view, if you're learning Cloud Foundry and you're actually uh, competent and expert in Cloud Foundry, then you're opening up a whole huge opportunity in terms of the, the, the roles that you can perform. Um, and the other thing is, of course, for us is we reckon we would have had to rebuild several of our apps, several of our software platforms, once if not twice in the past five years as uh, our customers have fallen out with their infrastructure providers and turned around and said, actually, we need to move. Okay, so we can't use them anymore because uh, we don't like what they're charging us or we're, we're just unhappy with the level of service and we want to move over there. Now, we haven't had to um, do a great deal of work about redesigning or recoding to, to utilise the specific services that <coughs> that uh, IaaS provider are, 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 are offering. So we've not got... Okay, so, but that doesn't mean that you're, not, you're unable to leverage... The, um, the, the platform specific, or sorry, the uh, IaaS uh, specific services. So that is perhaps one of the biggest benefits and the, one of the most important learnings that we've had. Very fortunate in, in our use of, uh, of uh, in our decision to, to run with Cloud Foundry, um, but one of the magnificent benefits that we've received. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tim now just to talk about what else we've learned um, because there's been some more. Uh, learnings about um, how you know you're on the right track in terms of your cloud native journey. Right, so I'm conscious of time as well, so I'll make this fairly quick. So this is all about the cloud native journey and how you know um, organisations are you know adopting or getting involved. Um, you might be sort of thinking about Cloud Foundry, a whole bunch of things, but. What we're trying to do here is this, this is a list of pointers as to, in this case, you might be losing the way, the cloud nati native way, when, there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, the PaaS is the IaaS. Um, you're directly dependent on IaaS uh, offerings. Um, the collaboration contract, so that single contract we were just talking about, um, that contract is broken. So when you've got um, your developers, the people adding value, if they aren't pushing directly or you know, using a CI or something, then you've suddenly, you know, you're in that position where you've got a silo. Um, component cost is more important than developer cost. So we hear people that are talking about the efficiencies they can get from moving down from X to Y in terms of the you know, machine size or the performance or whatever. What's actually the bigger cost is the amount of time these guys are spending doing it or the amount of time that's involved in you know, the developer cost, the true cost of ownership, and that's never really appreciated or looked at. Um, complexity isn't adding value, so 
the complexity that you're adding in, and it is a complexity, put it, you know, sort of going to a PaaS and microservice architecture, that is some complexity you're adding. You should then be able to iterate and add value on top of that. If you're not, you're losing your way. Um, developers aren't empowered. Uh, it sort of relates back to uh, point two, but the further you move away from a self-service model, the more uh, velocity and empathy is reduced. Uh, apps aren't 12-factor. I think everyone knows about 12-factor and so on, so I think that speaks for itself. Uh, tooling is deeply abstracted or version-specific. So we've seen scenarios where the tooling has got so complex to allow a push or to allow environments to, you know, sort of builds to happen or a whole complex chain of events that have to happen for something to get into production that you've sort of stepped away from the path of, you know, the simplicity that you should have in terms of how you get, you know, uh, applications into production. Forking Cloud Foundry, I think that speaks for itself. Um, we've seen it. Um, you expect PaaS to behave like ours. So this is um, you know, where you sort of, you expect the instant access to the sweetie shop uh, that IaaS is. Um, there's no process to get existing staff to transition. So I think this has been a topic for quite a lot of talks today around you know, that not being part of the process. Um, and when Cloud Foundry is a solution, not an enabler. So I think somebody mentioned earlier, uh, Cloud Foundry uh, delivers zero user value. It delivers nothing. It enables you. It isn't the solution. Uh, so if it is the solution, it's being talked about as a solution, as it's solving the problem, uh, you're losing your way. Um, and you solve problems with version numbers, not patterns. So. Um, this is where you know, people are talking about waiting for X or Y version because that will solve all your problems. You know, if that's the world you're in, then things are going wrong. So you should floor it uh, when, and this is when you're on the right path, uh, your architecture is cloud native. Um, you can do small, quick, iterative developments. You've got multiple teams working on mo multiple components. They're all working to contracts between each other. You can progress. Uh, and you can add value quickly. The apps are easy to deploy. Um, so they're 12-factor apps. They get their config from the environment. A whole bunch of things that I imagine people here either know about or will learn about. Um, your apps can be automatically tested. So you can't get to this world of continuous deployment, continuous integration without you know, thoroughly tested environments. And as much as you know, we, we practice it and we, you know, we see it, but we're constantly improving it and progressing it. Um, insight and logging are designed by the application developers. So migrating from a self-build infrastructure as a service environment to PaaS uh, often means that sort of a lot of the insight you had before will be lost and needs to be, um, you'll get some from the PaaS, some from you know, Cloud Foundry gives you some insight, but you need to um, build in business level metrics, you know, how long are your applications taking, you know, all the stuff you need to understand what's going on. Um, either at the application level or sometimes sort of build packy level. Um, your business differentiator is not platform dependent. So this is true for a lot of use cases, uh, even though businesses maintain their special snowflakes. But sometimes it's not. Uh, so example, the uh, super low latency trading platform that Ben was talking about earlier. Um, and your business profile business process is agile too. So often go live and releases uh, are entirely blocked by uh, internal regulation, compliance, a whole bunch of processes that are entirely non-agile. And that's, you know, that's something you need to be agile. And if that is, yeah, if you've brought them with you and taken them on your journey, uh, you are on you know, the cloud native journey. So thank you very much. Uh, our information is up there. We are hiring, so if anyone's you know, looking for new work, give us a shout. Thank you very much, everyone. Or in other words, when is it appropriate to run your own uh, 
PS uh, on on the iOS at the same time. So, so but the, the the point that I was making was more that your whatever you're calling your PaaS is utterly dependent on something that's very infrastructure uh, IaaS specific. So, for example, you know you're using an uh, AWS component that is specific to AWS, you know, you're not in a position where you can be portable, you can't go multi-cloud, you haven't got any of that flexibility. So that's, that was the point I was making. Uh, does that answer your, yeah, sort of yeah, doesn't answer yeah, your yeah, question, yeah. but yeah, okay. And Um, at the time, OpenShift existed, uh, and there was quite a lot of work going on there, so we did evaluate it at the time. We spent quite a bit of time working with both, uh, and we eventually decided on Cloud Foundry, um, a choice I'm glad we made <laughs> now. Hmm? I, I couldn't, actually, because I wasn't involved in that decision. I was on the other, other team. But, um, yeah, I could find out for you if you want to, yeah, we could give you the reasons, although it's probably now very out of date, but, um, yeah. Look okay. at any others? Nope. Okay. I think the next talk is quite soon. I don't think it's a big gap, so um, I'll drop out. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.